Hello everyone and welcome to The Green Flame, the deep green resistance broadcast that brings you radical analysis, practical skills, and artistic expression from the revolutionary movement to defend the planet and rebuild just human communities. I am your host and comrade, Max Wilbert. I am Jennifer Mernan, your co-host for this episode of The Green Flame. On February the 28th of 2021, The Green Flame posted the episode Fairy Creek Urgent Appeal with Max Wilbert and Forest Defenders Joshua Wright and Carol Tutil. This update was recorded with Carol on Thursday, June 3rd. This was the 300th day of direct action protecting Vancouver Island's ancient temperate rainforests, according to the Fairy Creek Blockade Facebook page. Before we begin listening to this update, I feel compelled to state the obvious. None of what you are about to hear would be happening at Fairy Creek if the invasion and colonization of the territories of the Pachidot and Dittidot First Nations had not occurred. The land thieves, the occupiers, civilization has been waging a genocidal and ecocidal war of exploitation since arrival. Thank you for listening to this urgent update from Fairy Creek with Carol. I'm just going to say welcome to the Green Flame again, Carol. We left off with an urgent appeal where you and Joshua were on that episode, and it was right before a court date on March the 5th, and so much has happened up at Fairy Creek at the blockade since then. Could you update us on what's happening now, please? Well, of course, the um, the court, a very old-fashioned judge, and the court system being what it is, upheld the injunction. Arguments about... An endangered ecosystem did not wash. Um, As far as the judge was concerned, um, teal cedar was granted permits to log from the government, black and white, boom. So then, of course, the judge wanted the injunction to be upheld. And we, of course, want to protect this incredibly rare and invaluable uh, ecosystem. So... There's a you know a few small ecosystems that we've been trying to protect in the area. Um, Kai Kuse had some of the mo- the biggest trees on this planet, and it's being uh, unfortunately our tree setters were removed. Our blockade was taken down. One day Tuesday, uh, May twenty seventh, or was it May twenty fifth? Let me check. Yeah, Tuesday, May twenty fifth. Forty one people outside of the the RCMP exclusion zone were arrested for peacefully demonstrating. The road wasn't even blocked. And they took the police, they they took down the police liaisons and uh, legal observers first. You know, this was starting before 8.30 in the morning. It it absolutely shocking um, overreach of power, and especially from a police service, a national police service that's meant to be there to protect the people, but it's clearly there on behalf of, well, a logging company. Massive, absolutely incredible amounts of RCMP and vehicles. I cannot imagine the tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions, um, this operation will cost. It's actually quite shocking to see how arbitrary you know, basically, for the last, I think, week on and off, the RCMP have been basically blocking anybody from going into the entire TFL area. So that includes people who live in the area. It's it, it's really quite something to see dozens of RCMP vehicles and even more RCMP officers uh, in one spot and then just go out and arrest people randomly, people on crown land. We pay for the, most of those roads. Um, the group that was arrested in, in outside of the exclusion zone on Tuesday, May 25th, we weren't blocking. We were there as a demonstration. Should the media be allowed in? Keeping the media out has been a very big part of this. The RCMP will have the media meet at one area, say 9.30 in the morning, and then they'll go Meantime, get their crew ready to get an operation going a minimum two-hour drive away. The lack of media 
which of course, this is by design by the RCMP, is not doing us a, a service. You know, we need media to see what goes on. Uh, not to mention the absolutely brilliant and fun tree sits and, and equipment and uh, antics for peacefully blockading. We've had groups of dozens of senior citizens show up, you know, seniors for Cedar, uh, seniors for our future. You know, we've got lots of families with children showing up. And then the RCMP will randomly decide to go in and arrest a whole pile of people because the media aren't there. So I think what they're doing is catch and release. They go and they arrest a pile of people for doing nothing. Um, and of course, they are arresting people who are protecting and using uh, equipment to make it difficult to arrest. But they're also arresting a lot of innocent people who are doing no harm, except perhaps uh, going over an arbitrary exclusion zone. Um, I, I keep harping on Tuesday, May 25th, because it was shocking. When we were there, the RCMP didn't even have their little yellow lineup. All that was there for the RCMP was a porta potty. And we watched, you know, we basically waved in for industry trucks. We were there to make a bit of a show for media. And well, I wonder if a, a big flatbed to pick up uh, trees, we might've changed our mind at that point, let me tell you, but um, no, we weren't blocking anybody. And, um, you know, we didn't have good conversations and an RCMP officer basically said, oh, he'll go get the um, DLT unit or representatives. And they didn't show up, but rather over 30 RCMP vehicles, including paddy wagons, it's probably about 35 vehicles and probably double that amount of RCMP or at least 60 RCMP. I saw the first wave of 15 cars um, and I counted 27 RCMP. Uh, but of course, a lot more showed up. Masses of people are being illegally arrested. And then what they're doing is, is giving us, so that establishes that we'll have a record. Uh, even though I don't think it would stand, it, it, wouldn't, it won't be um, upheld in court. And I'll fill in a bit more on that in a few moments. But now that establishes the RCMP's ability. So the next time there's an arrest, they can put all these people um, in jail. So basically, it's not a first arrest the next time, but a second arrest. So the RCMP have been told off twice. I think it was in 2013 with, I believe, once in New Brunswick and then also in Labrador over the, uh, oh dear, one of the hydro sites where they were doing performing this sort of action. And again, strongly reprimanded uh, by the Cil Civilian Review Complaints Commission and by the courts for what was done with the Wet'suwet'en in 2020. You know, they're not allowed to create these ex exclusion zones. They are creating dangerous situation and causing all sorts of traffic congestion. They have deliberately kept journalists out. So journalists cannot see some of the dangerous incompetence that's going on. There was one fellow up a tree who left his boat, climbed further up, and then you had two RCMP officers with a huge helicopter forcing this. He was like way up there. So the tree is thin like this. And he's holding on for dear life. This helicopter's coming down. And, you know, the tree swaying like this. And then two large officers are there to grab him. And they didn't do it right. Um, he thought that was going to be the end of his life. We're talking about a young 24-year-old man. Um, another young woman, I'm pretty sure she's her early 20s, but certainly in her 20s, uh, was threatened with tear gas and rubber bullets if she didn't come down from her tree set. So she was on a tree set and then she climbed up higher. And um, so then she was threatened with this. Of course, she got her sleeping bag later and it, it was riddled in bullet holes. The other set, tree setters were being subject to uh, logging one or two, like literally one tree beside them. So our simply were allowing in loggers, fellers to do their work and to mock and threaten and, you know, perform a bit of a, a psychological operations. So it's been very much not for the people who do not want to see these forests go. It makes absolutely no sense. Scientists around the world have been decrying this, but we have a very duplicious two-faced government that likes to be all things to all people and make a big display that, oh yes, the NDP is going to protect all growth. And all they've done is lie about what they're protecting. And with the supposed two-year deferral that they put in place uh, last September, 
only 3,800 hectares out of 353,000 hectares is actually all growth that needed protecting. The NDP loves to go on about whatever, uh, more than a million hectares of old growth being looked at, but most of that is high alpine, <laughs> bog, or previously logged. I can go on and on about the duplicitousness, but it's just incredible the Orwellian display and length that they will go to to keep this facade going. And what's even sadder are the people who believe them because people think, oh, the NDP are so much better than the Liberals. Well, <laughs> I don't think so. And then, of course, we only have two Green Party members, and they've been trying for years to stop, you know, all growth logging and to get a moratorium on it or have it protected. So the NDP have deliberately orchestrated the best of the last to be logged. So once these forests are gone, and it'll be within a few years, that's it. So people are waking up. There's a lot of young people. This, this movement is Indigenous and youth-led. These young people, well, putting themselves on the line. I'm, I'm in absolute awe of what they're doing. And it, and it puts the rest of us to shame, really, because they are putting their lives on the line. This is how strongly they feel. The last couple of weeks, many tears, not from me, but from young people who are just devastated at what they're watching and what, um, what sort of world they're going to have. I grew up surrounded by forests and they're gone. You know, our weather regulator, our, our flood sponge, our climate mitigator, it's almost all gone. And what they're doing now is wiping out the fragments. They're wiping out the history. And we see these skeleton forests all over our mountains. And these stumps now, because of the extreme forest fires we have, the extreme weather, the extreme drought, the extreme rains. Again, we've lost the sponge to absorb the rain. And we're now, we're now entering, um, or we have entered the cycle of drought and um, you know extreme per uh, precipitation. So, you know, this government will spend $650 million to fight forest fires in one summer, which is now, that, that was our last bad forest fire summer. The summer before that, which I think would be um, either 2018 or 2019, I'm afraid everything's just melding into one right now, $619 million on fighting forest fires. It caused the forest fires is of course, clear cut logging. And then a couple of summers ago, um, it was $650 million. We do not get revenue from this industry to so much as pay for the cost of running the Ministry of Forests, let alone all the other costs, such as forest fire fighting, uh, flood mitigation, $50 million into Grand Forks alone, a tiny, tiny village, um, but just to prevent the next season's flooding. I mean, everything's been logged around there. It's, the town was underwater. So many people lost their homes. You know, we're having to put in water treatment plants. A couple of summers ago, the courts, the BC Supreme Court deemed that British Columbians do not have the right to clean drinking water. We have the right to build water treatment plants. So we now spend tens of millions of dollars per community on water treatment plants that not only require maintenance, they, they need to be replaced every now and then. Victoria and Vancouver are doing just fine because they own their own watersheds. So we have a couple of good stories there, but at least I believe Vancouver owns it. It may be a lease. I, I can't remember. But we did have legislation even until the, 19, until the 1970s to protect our watersheds. Even in the United States in the 1800s, they knew watersheds were important and need protect, protection from industry <laughs> and certainly from logging. So now we've had well over, probably over 150, probably over 160 arrests. Uh, we've repeatedly repopulated some of these camps. But of course, the RCMP, our BC government, and by the way, the NDP is also stating that they have nothing to do with police enforcement, which is a bit of a joke, but that's in keeping with um, how Premier Horrigan always plays the innocent card. Oh, there's nothing we can do about TMX pipelines. Oh, Site C was already decided. So we just have to go and spend another 12 to $16 billion on this boondoggle. You know, and then of course, LNG and more pipelines. <sighs> yeah, we, we are in our Orwellian times here. And we do have a government that continues to say that it's protecting all growth when in actual fact it's increased in the last year alone in, in 2020. Uh, allocation for old growth logging. That is during the 
uh, supposed old growth strategic review and the announcements that old growth is being protected and deferred and on it goes. So, you know, we, we vote in these politicians and they're allowed to lie. And what recourse do we have? There's a lot of us out there trying and more and more people show up. But it is difficult. Clay Cossin was at 850 arrests. Is that what it takes? It's going to cost a whole lot more to do this policing than this government will get out of, uh, for revenue out of this entire industry. It's insane. I, I don't know what's going to go on, whether the this is continue or I, I know the government will just continue with uh, facade after facade and will not do what is right. There's no ecological understanding. No, no. Um, there's just an understanding of profit and, and turning yeah. profit and funneling. There's no profit to us. We're paying to have our forest lawn. Right, you know, right. Just again, just the cost to run the Ministry of Forests. Because we don't even get enough revenue from the industry. The industry makes lots of revenue, lays off employees all the time, and most employees are now contracted out. And, you know, it's this boom bust cycle. But as a taxpayer, that industry does not provide enough revenue uh, to pay for the cost of running the ministry that regulates it. Mm. And then on top of that, there's all the other expenses. We're, lo- we're going to lose tourism. People come here to see magnificent forests. Now they're coming here just to clear cuts, you know, and what we have left, (laughs) the best of what we have, they're wiping out. Every generation starts with a low bar. And what they're doing right now is to deliberately wipe out our history. And it's happening quickly. I'm looking at the erosion of these, you know, skeleton stumps on, on, on Rocky mountainsides. And they are, they're eroding quickly. And then of course, in, in the lowland areas, you've got all the shrubbery growing up quickly. So um, a lot has been lost, but more than anything, along with our souls, um, is the basis of our life support system, the basis of our lives up here. You know, BC was heaven on earth. (laughs) But anyhow, I'm afraid uh, it's catching up with us because we now suffer from extreme forest fires and extreme um, dry spells, and it's only going to get worse. You did say that you're in awe of what this youth-led, Indigenous-led mm. movement is doing, and that they keep on repopulating the camps, that in spite of all those tears and all that pain at what is happening, their hearts just won't let, won't give up. And so... No, yeah, yeah. It won't, but of course, you can only be arrested, you know, most people, young people so far have been arrested once, and it's scary for them. And then there's the little psychops where... Uh, women are hearing that their children will be removed from them. Oh, that they'll never be able to get a decent job. You know, they're, they're, they'll have their careers ruined because of their record. You know, with, with that arbitrary arrest of 41 people a week ago Tuesday, um, we were being told that we'll have criminal, civil and criminal charges for being on crown land legally, peacefully. <laughs> you know, just we had... Indigenous youth drumming, you know, it was just an, a, a sacred fire going, uh, at least I, I, I assume it was a sacred fire. Um, perhaps it was just a fire, but I assume it was a sacred fire. But anyhow, it is incredible that officers stoop so low as to say what they say. And so you have officers like that, and then you have others that, oh, we don't know what's going on, but we just have to tell you that you'll receive blah, blah, blah charges in the mail. There's all this innocence too. Oh, I've got to do my job. I really don't know the circumstances, but you're under arrest, blah, blah, blah. It's insane. There's no responsibility. And we have a government that's removed itself from all responsibility. And it's also given a police force more power and command than our military. And not only are we subject to police helicopters every day, sometimes a few times a day, but there's even been the military helicopter out there, which means, and I'm absolutely disgusted that the military are getting involved in this. They should know better. It's disgusting the RCMP are doing this. And especially in light of the fact that they've been reprimanded at least four times in the past for pulling these sorts of tactics, arbitrary arrests, exclusion zones, but they're, they're ramping it up. It's like they're trying to set their own precedents you know, see what they can get away with. And our governments are just allowing them to see what they can get away with. 
yeah, it's um, it's incredible what's going on. Very or- Orwellian. <laughs> Very Orwellian. I went to the Fairy Creek Blockade uh, Facebook today and found some information there. You know, direct appeals for we need you at camp. We need you mm-hmm. to um, donate. We need you to sign this petition. We need you to join protests wherever you are on the planet. And so after this update from you, Carol, I'm going to make sure that I, I have all of that information for people to go to, that they can go to those sites, as well as going to the, mm-hmm. the page where I saw that a couple of things have happened. There's an open letter there that just came out on the 2nd, and there is also a statement from Paul Stamets. There's been um, mm-hmm. support from all over the world oh, yes. Scientists to, to, to support this yeah. fight. Yeah. 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 Oh, absolutely. Scientists have been crying for us to preserve what little we have left of these forests with, with giant trees. And literally, we only have in all of BC over a year ago, April 2020, we only had 35,000 hectares in all of BC of forests with very large trees. And then we have um, had, because they're logging, <laughs> or operations could, are a 24 hour a day job. The end of December, uh, on a Sunday evening at five o'clock, the floodlights went on for them, you know, to start hauling away and, and sort and load and so on. But so on top of 35,000 hectares of forest with very large trees, we have 380,000 hectares of forest with large trees. The absolutely mass forest with absolutely massive trees, even bigger, they're gone. Although there may be a tree here and there. One, one of them was driven, a piece of it driven up the road last week. You know, and somebody caught it during the day. They made the mistake. They drove it during the day. The same thing happened from uh, somebody I know who took a photo of a massive tree. We're talking one small piece of a massive tree. Only one piece can fit on a huge logging flatbed truck. And then that, I think, was in October. So, you know, these companies know where the last giants are. The sort of force that isn't even included in stats anymore because it's just so rare. And to our knowledge, it doesn't exist. You know, industry controls our forest, our public resource. And um, the Ministry of Forest is there to serve, serve industry. And now the latest game show is for an industry that where large co- companies contract everything out. And now it's going to be the First Nations turn to, turn to take advantage of logging their forests. So I I foresee all sorts of issues happening, not to mention, you know, the First Nations that are being forced into these supposedly community beneficial agreements um, that have clauses that basically state they will not allow community members to oppose forestry operations. I mean, it's incredible, you know, gag order written into these agreements. But my prediction is that because First Nations are being forced to log for revenue and companies, these large companies are the ones with the capacity. So rather than all the contractors they're currently contracting out, they'll be contracting out First Nations. So it's, it's, it's not, there's not going to be anything new here. It's just going to be once again, you know, a downloading or offloading for um, a different group of people to do the dirty work. Um, it's, it's absolutely deceptive what's going on. Yeah, and it's a shame. You know, again, a government that promised to bring in um, endangered species legislation. Because let's face it, we have endangered species in old growth forests. Many species are reliant on old growth forests. And, you know, any biologist can tell you, hydrologist, that the best water filtration system is old growth forest. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, what can I say? Not much of that left. And they're even taking down the fire breaks. Uh, when we had real foresters out there, instead of just uh, timber mining, uh, or vast areas of, of old growth was left just as fire break. <laughs> Those are being taken down. <laughs> it's insane. It's beyond insane. Thank you for updating us on what's happening and for providing such a wealth of information about all the convoluted and atrocious things that are happening through business and through governments to the ancient forests and and ultimately to all of the people on the planet. Um, It seems as if what's left is becoming a forest defender 
if there's going to be anything left of this planet, then yeah. defend your beloved, defend the land that gives you mm-hmm. life, defend forests, your oceans, wherever you are, yeah. and stand in solidarity with the people that defend their land all over the planet. Is, yeah. is there anything that, that you can add to the list that I'm seeing online? about what is needed at Ferry Creek and what is needed in uh, this pestering long governments. Long, yeah, pestering if governments. You, pestering governments. If you can't get here to support, please, Pastor, send money. You I know, did that expensive. today. We're, we're even getting, you know, our vehicles are being towed off public roads because they're in exclusion, arbitrary exclusion zones. The RCMP has repeatedly told us that our property will be in the hands of, of a company. <laughs> the amount of offloading and downloading of responsibility for a situation caused by our government um, and then acted out by the RCMP. It, it's just astronomical. It's, 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 it's just unbelievable. So what else to do? Yeah, just call, call constantly, email, pester, write. Letters mean something. And don't let up. Call people you know in the industry. You know, maybe it's time for people to have serious conversations with people who believe, I mean, seriously, this government and so many people believe that these forests are decadent. The trees are going to fall anyhow because they're rotting inside, which is, you know, kind of what trees do. It's like life. They have to be gotten rid of. I, I mean, a child can understand basic ecology, but we have a government and a certain sector of the population that simply does not. It's um, it's tragic. But yes, I've been an armchair activist for decades. I, I'm, I'm burnt out doing the letter writing and the, the phone calling and the meetings and, you know, seeing my MLA with hope only to be completely let down and betrayed. And that's been various MLAs, um, numerous politicians. You know, I think in many ways we're... We are at the end game for a future for our children, for a future for wildlife, for really this wonderful, beautiful world. And here I am living in one of the most beautiful areas on the planet. And the changes I've seen in my time, um, when we think of our grandparents who went through two world wars, and we think, oh, well, we'll never go through anything like that. We'll never see the changes they saw. But you know what? Um, We're going through more than what they've gone through. Only just hasn't hit people yet, but it will be. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And I couldn't agree with you more. This is one endless war. And like you, I've, I've, I've lived in place long enough to have seen it and to have noticed that steady decline of what is real. Yeah. And what is important. And mm-hmm. I love what you just said about <laughs> you can be let down over and over and over again. But one of the most important things is never, never, never give in and never give up. Yeah. Never stop. No, if we give up, then yeah. it's, it's, it's game over. We still have a chance. We still hope that, um, you know, people are rising up. People really are waking up to yes, the they are. what we're going to be hit with. You know, then apparently there are, you know, there are RCMP who actually realize <laughs> these forests are the basis of our ecology and therefore our existence, but they'll follow their orders, which is sad. To me, I don't understand this because even with, under the Geneva Convention, when even the, at the individual soldier level, when you know that what you're fighting for is absolutely wrong, then you have a duty not to do it. Yes. So what we have here is an entire force of officers um, performing a siege and a crime on the civilian population. And they are basically helping perform a serious ecocide. You know, we can't rein in these companies. They'll do what they do. That's bad enough. And that's bad enough that we have to listen to their executives and whatever employees and contractors uh, fool themselves. Um, but when you have your own government and the police who are meant to be protecting you in an all out war against the public to protect corporate interests, just anyhow. Yeah. Where are we? Um, but let's face it. The, 
the further removed from the environment people are, the more psychologically affected, negatively affected they are. When you and I were in school as kids, there might have been one or two fat children, really. Even in a big high school, 2,000 kids, maybe a few. And who do we know that were on serious anxiety medication and all sorts of medications for mental health? Well, (laughs) that's what we have now. Whereas a walk in the woods, breathing the chemicals that a real forest provides, it revives anyone and everyone. That's why we have forest bathing around the planet. Oh, but not here. No, we're going to cut it all down. You know, when it, with uh, a couple of summers when the smoke was so bad and grew up in BC, I left in my late 20s and lived across Canada, and finally came back. Vancouver, Vancouver Island was never in a smoky haze. I live midway up the east coast of Vancouver Island. Two summers in a row, you could not see three feet in front of you. So I went into the wall brand where it's smoky above the canopy and beautiful fresh air under it. You know, I'm breathing at last real air and, you know, able to enjoy the benefits of being in there. So to steal this from us is beyond criminal. It really is. And how these people live with themselves is beyond me. But then when you look at the atrocities of wars, how do people do it? And and frankly, we need to have an educated police force that will do more than just take blind orders. They have a duty to be citizens and to actually do something positive for their children as well as ours. They have a duty to protect. And frankly, the only way now to protect people is to protect the environment. Because without the environment, well, we won't be, uh, we'll be somewhat hooped. Let's put it that way. (laughs) We'll leave it at that. (laughs) Yes. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Lovely to meet you. (laughs) Thank you so much for the update. You can find more information on the page laststandforforest.com. That's L A S T S T A N D F O R. F O R E S T S dot com and on Fairy Creek Blockade Facebook. I will now quote from the Fairy Creek Blockade Facebook page. Quote Want to get involved? Come to camp. Join us at Fairy Creek headquarters. Come prepared to camp overnight, self sufficient. Arrestees and non arrestees are needed daily. Up-to-date information will be provided on arrival. Can't come in person? Join a local event. Check with your local Extinction Rebellion, Fridays for Future, or any other activist group focused on protecting our planet and indigenous sovereignty. If there's none in your area, rally your friends and start your own. Call, email, and or write your MLA. Tell them in your own passionate words why you think these forests should be protected. Sign and share the petition. End the logging of British Columbia's old growth forests. Donate. Support the frontline forest defenders. End quote. Please go to Fairy Creek Blockade Facebook for a link to the petition and for a link to donate to Fairy Creek. One final offering for our non-Indigenous listeners. For those who fight on the side of the living in solidarity with Indigenous people, DGR offers these guidelines. It is important that members of settler culture ally themselves with Indigenous communities fighting for their rights and survival, but there are right and wrong ways to express solidarity. The following guidelines have been put together by Deep Green Resistance members with the help of Indigenous activists. They aren't a complete how-to guide. Every community and every situation is different, but they can hopefully point you in a good direction for acting effectively and with respect. The guidelines from DGR are, first, 
And foremost, we must recognize that non-Indigenous people are occupying stolen land in an ongoing genocide that has lasted for centuries. We must affirm our responsibility to stand with Indigenous communities who want support and give everything we can to protect their land and culture from further devastation. They have been on the front lines of biocide and genocide for centuries, and as allies we need to step up and join them. Second, you are doing indigenous solidarity work not out of guilt, but out of a fierce desire to confront oppressive colonial systems of power. Third, you are not helping indigenous people. You are there to join with, struggle with, and fight with indigenous peoples against these systems of power. You must be willing to put your body on the line. Fourth, recognize your privilege as a member of settler culture. Fifth, you are not here to engage in any type of cultural, spiritual, or religious needs you think you might have. You are here to engage in political action. Also, remember, your political message is secondary to the cause at hand. Sixth, never use drugs or alcohol when engaging in indigenous solidarity work. Never. Seventh, do more listening than talking. You will be surprised what you can learn. Eighth, recognize that there will be indigenous people that will not want you to participate in ceremonies. Humbly refrain from participating in ceremonies. Ninth, recognize that you and your indigenous allies may be in the minority on a cause that is worth fighting for. And tenth, work with integrity and respect. Be trustworthy and do what you say you are going to do. Thank you for joining us for this urgent episode of The Green Flame. This is Max Wilbert, one of the hosts of the Green Flame podcast. I want to thank you for listening to our show and let you know a few ways that you can support the Green Flame. First, you can subscribe to our platform using the podcasting system of your choice. We're listed on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pocket Cast, and all the rest. We're even on YouTube. Leaving us a positive review or rating on these platforms helps us reach a larger audience. You can also share these shows with your friends. If you're interested in donating to support the production of The Green Flame, please visit deepgreenresistance.org. And finally, the goal of this show is to activate people. So if you really want to support this show, start organizing in your own community. Thank you again for listening.